The phrase the Twelve raises suspicions as well. Writing the Twelve instead of the Disciples is how someone living much later would have referred to the disciples we know from the Gospels. It assumes the reader knows what the term the Twelve actually means. Nowhere else in the entire New Testament do we find this terminology used to refer to the disciples, and it carries a sort of nostalgic reverence that Paul would never have used having met Cephas, James, and John in person and even arguing with them vociferously over doctrinal issues. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Another thought regarding this is that many times, copyists would insert what they would consider clarifications. Here is just one example where a copyist altered the text of Luke's Gospel based on his knowledge of the Gospel of Matthew. This comes from page 97 of Ehrman's book, Misquoting Jesus. Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer is the one we are most familiar with, and it's usually because the most embellished and detailed version wins out over the shorter and less detailed version. Luke's original version sounds quite truncated compared to Matthew's. Father, hallowed be your name. May your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive our sins, for we forgive our debtors and do not lead us into temptation. This version just sounds flat, doesn't it? So, copyists familiar with Matthew simply corrected Luke's shorter version by adding the missing parts from Matthew's version. Here's how the corrected version of Luke reads, which can be found in the King James translation. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive our debtors and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the same way, Someone might try to harmonize Paul's letters with the later gospel accounts and insert the part about Jesus appearing to the Twelve. Today, we would call this unethical. To alter someone's letter in any way would be wrong. Regardless, this could be a pure motivation on the part of the copyist, who probably thought he was merely clarifying the issue when in fact, Paul never shows any knowledge of disciples in any of his letters. Now, what about this claim that over 500 brethren saw Jesus at once? Again, this smells like a later attempt to provide some kind of evidence for Jesus' resurrection. Because wouldn't 20 or 30 people be enough evidence? Over 500 simply smells like fiction. Since Paul never speaks about Jesus' death and resurrection in terms of historical details, an Orthodox Christian copying this would naturally be tempted to embellish in order to strengthen the case. But now let me pose what I feel is probably a better explanation than that the entire passage is a later insertion. Paul was a man who admitted that he was prone to having visions, or what we might call today, hallucinations. In one passage, he claims to have gone up into heaven, and that he did not know if he had been bodily caught up to the third heaven, or if it was just some kind of vision. This brings up an interesting question. Could the appearances mentioned by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 be visions of Jesus? Appearances that no doubt seemed quite real to Paul and the rest of the apostles, but in the end was merely a vision, a picture, an image of Jesus in Paul's mind's eye. There are many cases of people seeing visions in the Bible and especially in the Old Testament, but can we cite any instances of Paul seeing visions? In fact, we can, but let's first have a quick look at a few other visions mentioned in the Gospels. In Luke, the angels at the tomb are referred to as a vision. Moreover, certain women of our company amazed us, having been early at the tomb, and when they found not his body, 
they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, who said that he was alive. Let's look at one from the Gospel of Mark. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and brought them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his garments became radiant and exceedingly white, as no launderer on earth can whiten them. That line always makes me chuckle. Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to answer, for they became terrified. Then a cloud formed, overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. All at once they looked around and saw no one with them anymore, except Jesus alone. Here we have Moses and Elijah appearing to several people at once, and the Greek word used is horao, the exact same Greek word used in the 1 Corinthians 15 verses. So, are we to think that this was a physical appearance by Moses and Elijah? I suppose God could have poofed them physically down from heaven and then poofed them straight back up, but perhaps this was a vision of the prophets instead. Now, let me make the case that Paul the Apostle was prone to seeing such visions, and as such, his seeing of Jesus could quite easily be interpreted as merely a vision in his mind's eye or a hallucination that seemed quite real. According to Acts, or shall we say, Kata Acts, not in accordance with Acts, but based upon Acts, Paul saw a vision of Jesus at his conversion. Now, I personally find Acts to be fraught with fiction, and as such, these examples are just that, examples showing that visions were rampant during the early church, whether Acts is overall historically accurate or not. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you. What is interesting here is that Jesus appeared to Paul, yet Jesus was not physically present or visible in the literal sense. Paul, or Luke putting words into Paul's mouth, later goes on to describe this encounter just a few verses later as, wait for it, a vision. So, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision. Paul is saying here that he did in fact obey the instructions Jesus gave him in the vision on the road to Damascus. And in Acts 22, 17 through 18, we have another depiction of Paul seeing a vision. It happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I fell into a trance and I saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. Paul prays, falls into a trance, and then Jesus appears to him to give him a secret message. There can be no debate about this. It's explicit. Paul had a vision of Jesus, a hallucination, if you will, a waking dream. Paul was seeing Jesus in his mind's eye. To Paul, it no doubt seemed very real, but in fact, there was no Jesus present. And another passage in Acts claims that Paul saw a vision of a man begging him for help. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, 
Come over into Macedonia and help us. Now let's look at Paul himself admitting to having visions. Boasting is necessary, though it is not profitable, but I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. Here we have the same Greek word used for vision as in many of the verses in Acts, optasia. And it is noteworthy that Paul links this idea of visions with revelations of Jesus. Let's continue looking at the rest of Paul's vision. 